Okay, so here's where we have some corrections that I have to make um, for my previous video. So in examining my own PCB that I have in my possession, I discovered that this output coil does not actually connect directly to ground. It connects to ground through this diode and capacitor arrangement. Um, I did not notice this until I looked at my own circuit board and I saw that this piece extends all the way to the end. And apparently the circuit board on the driver coil side is notched like so because they have to make room, uh, they have to put this cut in here because of the molding in the plastic where the LED is inserted. There's a, a piece of plastic in here that this PCB has to clear. So we we can pretty much know that this side is actually supposed to be this way. This side, who knows? Um, it might kind of be the same way on the other side as well. And that kind of makes sense because that gives them a little bit of tolerance if if the if this hole was completely enclosed and the magnet was slightly too big, you'd be you wouldn't be able to get it in there. So it could very well be that the other side looks uh, similar. But anyways, um, and it also appears I lifted one end of my broken diode here and I saw the number eight. So I'm assuming it's probably actually a one in 4148. So I was wrong about that not being a one in 4148. Um, now, I did make a mistake on the coils here. Um, I believe I got the output and input coils mixed up. On the, on the circuit board I have, I don't actually have, it never came to me in one piece. The coils were already apart and I have no idea where which one went. And I think in going back over some notes, I believe that the input coil is actually the one with the tiny wire. And in the last video, I made a mistake about the wire gauge. I, uh, I was looking at a chart and uh, I forgot that I need to convert from millimeters <clears throat> from uh, millimeters to inches to figure out the wire gauge. So I mentioned it was like seven gauge and something else. I don't remember. Um, but that was wrong. The correct number would be like 44 wire gauge on uh, the input coil. And it would be approximately a thousand turns of, uh, of the wire there. And then the upper coil, um, it's either like a 35 or 36 gauge. And uh, it's approximately 200 turns. And uh, I, was, I was looking back at my inductance measurements and those just seem low to me. I, um, maybe my my meter can't read stuff that small or I'm getting false readings, but with that much wire, it seems like we should have like 10, between like 10 and 100 millihenries. But once again, it's not like a cup and core uh, inductor. It's something completely else. So it could actually be 10 microhenries. I'm not an expert in this area, so... Um, the inductance doesn't seem to be that important. It seems to be more of the turns of wire and the, uh, the, the magnet and all that stuff. So, um, now speaking of magnets, I did measure the, the magnets and I wanted to see what the gauze strength was. And I'm getting consistent readings between 1.5 and 2. And once again, uh, I've read that it's important that um, you know the the uh, phase and polarity of the magnets and all this stuff, but I, I'm just just re all I can do is report on what I physically can measure and stuff. So um, then one other thing I've done is in this PCB or PDF file, I've added the schematic and some pictures. This is the example that I found on the internet, and then this is the example of my own. And I just took these pictures this morning, and, and here you can see where on, on, on this drawing here, they this note says that 
basically they don't know where this if this connects anything and uh in my previous video i thought well okay it probably doesn't connect anything and so <laughs> i went hog wild and came to the wrong conclusions but in, on this picture here you can see that this trace goes all the way to here and this is the one that's connected to the the capacitor diode here so um this is why i had to make the part two of the video because when i when i discovered this after i'd already made part one i noticed that uh, I drew the wrong conclusions um, because I didn't quite have all the information. So that's why I made part two. And this this PDF is available to anyone who wants it. You can just email me at diyguitarist at mbarkmail.com, and that's with a Q. So now that I have my corrections and uh, pointing out my mistakes, from uh, part one of this series here. Let's go and look at the schematic in LT Spice and simulate it and um, you'll see what it's apparently doing. It kind of makes a little more sense than the conclusion I came to in part one. But once again, I didn't quite have all the information on the, the circuit board here. Um, so I came to the wrong conclusion, but let's take a look at the waveforms and the schematic how it is actually and uh, I think with that I have finally cracked the the whole Evo uh, circuit and how it works and stuff okay so here's the schematic as I had it in part one uh, with a few modifications but um, I had wrongly come to the conclusion that the the path to ground um, of the circuit was forced through the Zener diode when it was switched into regular mode. Um, what, while it, it, the, the waveform they saw kind of made sense to me and my limited knowledge, um, I was actually, I actually got that wrong because the what really happens is this this ground here, this piece of wire that goes away, this goes to ground, but then the output coil comes around and it goes and connects to this. And meanwhile, while I can get a working circuit with the Zener diode, which um, I come to the conclusion that this would probably have to be a 3.9 volt Zener diode to main, always maintain at least four volts here until the battery was about eight and a half volts. But um, <laughs> I think it was after I was done messing around with this that I discovered that connection on the PCB that I wasn't aware of. And uh, so this one now has to go in the trash. And this is actually what's going on. So on the corrected schematic here, we, as I mentioned earlier, we have this, this line that comes around, goes to the harmonic switch so that they can mess with how the output coil is grounded. So apparently what happens is the diode is, I guess, blocking the current from the normal direction it would be going. And so that therefore would be kind of reversing the currents in the output coil. I, I don't quite understand how that works, <laughs> but... That's what the patent documents claim, and uh, I'll show you that in just a second. And I surmise that this 10UF cap here is to provide a path to ground for the rest of the circuit. I think that's what's going on. So this works with the one in one, the one in 4148, and uh, so if we run it, this is what it's going to look like. So let's connect it to the regular mode. And you'll see we have a sine wave coming in. I'm simulating it at 300 millivolts, uh, open B string. Here's your sine wave. Now, when we look at the output coil, we get something that looks like this. So what it's doing is it's every cycle, it's it's driving, it's, it's kind of sending this pulse, I guess, into the driver coil. 
So this is kind of what it looks like. It looks very noisy, but you know, it's not an audio circuit. So um, if this was an audio circuit, boy, I, I can't even imagine what it would sound like. Um, now if you go into harmonic mode and run it, you'll see what's happening here is we're kind of missing the middle part here. And typically when I see harmonics on an oscilloscope, you know, they're kind of appearing in this region here, some kind of spike or something's going on. But in the, in the, uh, at the peak here, which I guess would be, I guess you could say that's your fundamental. That's kind of like, it just, there's a big notch right there. So that would be to, in my mind, this would be enhancing all the, all the possible harmonics that you have in here. And once again, it's it's maintaining the like every cycle, it's kind of sending this pulse to the driver coil. So this is, I believe, actually how the uh, Ebo works. And this this actually makes sense to me now. Um, let's take a quick look at the patent documents, and uh, I'll show you where it's described in the patent documents, how this is operating. So I think from looking at the patent documents here, we can see how all these schematics on the internet kind of follow this same format and why they're all wrong. Um, you know, why I mentioned in the previous video, that's still correct. There is no Zobel network on this circuit, but all these schematics I've seen on the internet repeat the same thing. You know, it's kind of like the little audio amplifier, the basic audio amplifier where you have, you know, your input comes in here, it gets amplified, and you have the Zobel network on the output, and it goes through driver coil. And if you want to do a boost, a uh, gain boost, you can do something between pins one and eight. Um, so that is part of the reason why all the schematics on the internet are wrong. I think people looked at the patent documents and go, oh, it's like this, which we've discovered in part one, it's not the case. So anyways, I'm going to go down to this section here. And I just outlined a few things. One is this where it mentions that the uh, magnetic cores would be composed of Alnico 5. And I like their clever wording. They left it open. They say, in the presently preferred embodiment, which means they can change their minds later and the patent still applies. That's kind of how I interpret it. Now, this just explains the basic operation. You know, if you pluck the string, it vibrates. If you sense by the coil, the movement causes the magnetic field associated with the coil to change and induces the current. The electrical signal generated is amplified by the off amp and produces a varying magnetic field, the same frequency in the coil, and so on, drives a string at the resonant frequency, therefore sustaining the vibrations of the string. Now this is the part I thought was interesting. Uh, if the string is not immediately plucked after the sustainer is in place, the sustainer, because of positive feedback, will cause the string to vibrate. And I think that's probably um, what that 13K resistor is all about. It's, it's providing a, a positive feedback that's, that's always there. Um, so here's where it talks about the harmonic mode. It's not called that here, but if you read it, it is describing what it is. It says in one embodiment, an unusual effect is produced where the current through the output coil is reversed. In such cases, it has been found that the fundamental frequency of the string is damped. However, the overtones or harmonics, harmonics are driven and become more pronounced. A manual switch may be used to permit selections of this effect. So that is basically the little switch on the Ebo. The one last item that I'm just really not sure about is what is the deal with these two round pads here? Um, I've always kind of been mystified by that. I don't really know what they're for. I don't think they're serving any functional 
use as far as the circuit's concerned. I'm, I surmise they're probably test points so they can test the circuit before they put it in the uh, enclosure. I don't know. If you have any ideas, let me know down in the comments.